first, thanks, Gong, for organizing this really awesome series of talks. I have been enjoying them a lot and plan to continue doing so. And also, I appreciate the opportunity to get to speak today, so thank you. Uh, today, my talk, The Case for Planar Fracture Models, uh, it is it really a challenging topic. It's a really kind of hot button topic um, because there's a huge diversity of beliefs out there. And I'll say up, up front that I have changed my views over time on this topic. So I hope that we generate some good thinking and discussion. I, uh, I expect that there's a lot of diversity of beliefs coming into this talk and there will still be a huge diversity of beliefs coming out of this talk, but want to share some perspectives. So the question that I'm asking is, what do hydraulic fractures look like in the subsurface? And a corollary, how should they be modeled? Because they shouldn't necessarily be modeled to look exactly like they look in the subsurface. Uh, just for practical reasons, they look pretty complicated in the subsurface. Uh, and specifically, should we use planar fracture models or complex fracture network models? Now, I will define those terms and discuss them in a moment. And also a corollary topic, should we model a, quote, stimulated rock volume of enhanced permeability around those hydraulic fractures, or should we not? Should we model a, a kind of uniform or constant permeability around those fractures? And so also I think one reason there's a huge diversity of beliefs is because the answer depends on the geologic setting, the goals of the modeling and the scale of the modeling. So if you're doing a research code on enhanced geothermal systems, which is hydraulic stimulation in granite, versus an engineering code for practically designing frack jobs in shale, it might, you know, the answer to what's the right modeling approach could be really different. So just be aware uh, uh, that there's a diversity of beliefs and, and possibly driven by the fact that there's a diversity of correct answers to this question. And, and maybe there isn't a correct answer, right? I also just wanna kind of give a shout out to the scientific method. Um, I think it's important for us in subsurface engineering to always think about how we are developing hypotheses and really those need to be tested against data. So planar fracture modeling and complex fracture network modeling, which I will define later, those are hypotheses about how fracturing is occurring in a formation. We really need to test those hypotheses. We should not go into uh, a project and just assume, well, it's one or the other, and then I know how to model this because I, I did this somewhere else and that was the right answer. We really need to recognize that you know, there are measurements we can take that can help us make these decisions. So uh, I'm gonna talk a fair amount about core through studies that have recently been performed that have been really influential on me. Uh, that's obviously the most expensive way to, to handle this, but it doesn't have to be that expensive. Um, I'm also gonna talk a fair amount about uh, results from operators putting fiber optic in offset wells, and that actually can be pretty cheap. Operators are now figuring out how to place the fiber optic, not outside the casing, but inside of the casing, uh, which is much cheaper as a temporary string. Uh, you can put that in an offset well before it's completed and you can actually directly observe frack hits in the offset wells. Uh, and also another approach that some operators use is uh, running an image log in a horizontal offset well. Um, for example, a child well, you could drill through uh, the SRV or nearby an, an older well that's already been fractured and then you can run the image log before you case and submit. So there are relatively cost um, effective ways to really start understanding in a direct measurement sense, you know, what do fractures look like? And then certainly micro seismic is a very important tool in our toolbox, but I think it's important to keep in mind that micro seismic is an indirect measurement. And there's quite a bit of, of interpretation that goes into micro seismic, uh, which is why I'm personally, uh, at least for the kind of detailed question I'm addressing here, I, I really appreciate direct measurements. All right, so today I'm gonna give some definitions. I'm gonna talk about classical motivation for, and by classical, I mean, you know, circa 2004 to 2015, uh, motivation for complex fracture network models. Then I'm gonna talk about some field observations, specifically core cross studies and fiber optics, which in my view, uh, tend to support arguments in favor of planar fracture models. A few secondary topics such as fracture turning and SRV, but also gonna address, I think an important subject, which is how do we handle small scale complexity with constitutive relations rather than trying to represent everything exactly. Um, and I'll just refer to a few uh, of my own relevant papers here. The first one, uh, which was at HFTS or HFTC this year, Nuances and Frequently Asked Questions in Field Scale Hydraulic Fracture Modeling. Um, much of the topic of this presentation is summarized in, in a section of that paper. And then two other relevant papers that I'll refer to, a Utica case study where we look at history matching, production data, 
in uh, Utica Shale and discuss how the permeability estimate impacts the history match as well as optimization and then also the technical write-up for ResRAC. So I will occasionally refer to some ResRAC simulation results in this presentation, not too much. It's not too much about ResRAC, but we do have a technical write-up you can refer to there. So I'll, I'll give a, a two minute summary of, of kind of my experience and where am I coming from here. Uh, my company, ResRAC, makes a fully integrated hydraulic fracturing and reservoir simulator. So it's a single code, a single simulation. You can simulate hydraulic fracturing, crop it placement, uh, transport in the wellbore, limited entry completion, and then also um, depletion. And that depletion affects the stress, and you can handle frack hits with, you know, frack fluid going into an oil and gas filled uh, parent well and fracture and, and opening those fractures back up, remobilizing profit. Uh, so that's, that's what our company uh, does. And um, I'm putting up this slide to just show kind of this is where my experience is informed. You know, my early career was from academia, which is a, a thought rich, data poor environment. Um, you know, since the beginning of 2018, uh, when we commercialized ResFrac, um, we have worked with mid-20s of companies, sold software license to them, as well as done a huge number of, of consulting projects for them. Uh, so I, we've now done, or I've, I've seen and done consulting projects where we actually history matched ResFrac simulations to the FRAC data and to the production data. And so I am basically what I'm saying today is informed by my experience uh, running, you know, these sorts of projects, uh, seeing a ton of data um, and, and doing a lot of history matching and modeling in, in nearly every major shale play in the U.S. And now you can see we've recently started doing work in Argentina. Um, and I'll just show a quick movie. This is what a ResFrac simulation would look like. So here we're only modeling a section of the well. And what you can see is there's a stacked pay. There's a variety of, of wells in this simulation. We're fracturing all of them. And then here in a moment, we're going to put them on production. And in the top right, you'll see the pressure depletion taking place in those fractures and in their formation. All right, so that's the kind of modeling that we do. You'll probably note that I'm showing planar fracture modeling. If you're familiar with the work I did earlier in my career, you might remember that at Stanford when I did my PhD and at UT, I was mostly doing not planar fracture modeling. I was mostly doing complex fracture network modeling. So I've actually, when I started ResFrac, I was starting to shift in my views on this, and I intentionally opted to go with a planar fracture modeling approach. And uh, the information that's come out since then has, has borne out, I think, that decision in my mind. So here's some definitions. A planar fracture model, um, oh, you know what? That is a typo. I'm going to delete that. It was incorrect. So a planar fracture model typically assumes one fracture per cluster, but not necessarily. There may or may not be fracture turning. You certainly could have complex 3D geometry. So for example, in the screenshot here, uh, that is a planar fracture model. You can see that in this case, those fractures are propagating in a straight line. Uh, that is not a requirement. A, a planar fracture model could have crack turning, uh, but they do have pretty complicated three-dimensional geometry. So they are stress shadowing each other. That's causing them to try to get out of each other's way. You can see a couple fractures are popping up through a stress barrier into the overlying zone. That's because the stress shadow is building up between all these clusters. Uh, and, and causing fractures to, to go through stress barriers and otherwise have complicated geometry. Uh, and in that image there, and in most of the rest rack images I might show, show uh, the axis is stretched. So those fractures appear further apart than they actually are in the model. So planar fracture modeling is the classical approach to fracture modeling. And, it, and as far as I can tell, it's still substantially the most widely used approach. There's, uh, I bet it's um, maybe not, I don't know about in academia, but I would say in you know, in industry, it is probably 80% uh, of the fracture modeling that occurs in industry would be a rough guess. Uh, but the key thing here is that the fractures are continuous. They're largely planes. They could be turning, they could be complicated, but they're largely continuous planes. And also, there's not a DFN. So a complex fracture network model is characterized by starting off with a DFN, a discrete fracture network of pre-existing fractures. The concept here is we're going to try to explicitly represent and mesh uh, a huge number of natural fractures that may or may not be present in the formation. And a second aspect of these complex fracture network models is termination. There's a concept that hydraulic fractures may terminate against natural fractures, and that creates a more zigzagging and branching flow network. So on the bottom left there, you can see these hydraulic fractures propagating away from the well. Then these fractures that are almost 90 degree angle 
Those are the natural fractures from the DFN, that was the initialization of the simulation. And these hydraulic fractures are, are terminating against those natural fractures. Then uh, perhaps reopening those, there's more hydraulic fractures branching off the natural fractures. So it's a little bit more of a maze-like uh, kind of branching, zigzagging uh, flow pathway. And so that's really the, the key difference is, uh, number one, the presence of a DFN, and number two, the, uh, the termination of hydraulic fractures against natural fractures. And, you know, you could have something kind of in between. Um, actually, I'll skip ahead to this slide to kind of give a little more commentary on these conceptual models. This is actually a figure from my PhD thesis, so this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. And I laid out kind of four end members. These are all kind of just end member simplified representations of, of different ways think, people think about hydraulic fracturing. And what I noticed in the literature, even back then, is that often people just pick one and then go with it. And it's sort of just taken as a given that, oh, well, we know it's X, Y, Z, uh, even though that's very often not well known and it's difficult to know. Uh, and it profoundly impacts the results of, of the modeling and all of the engineering work that's done. So, you know, I really, I'm, like to talk about this topic because I think it's a critical topic and it's something that we ought to spend a lot of time thinking about and I think it's it's easy to skip over this topic and just pick a, a, a paradigm and, and go forward with it uh, and, and I think it's important to always rethink our assumptions. So uh, these four approaches here on the far left is pure opening mode. That's the concept. So the red fractures in these cartoons are newly forming fractures and the blue fractures are pre-existing natural fractures. So on the bottom left, the, the pure opening mode, you have purely propagation of hydraulic fractures without any, uh, there could be natural fractures present, but they are not um, primarily hosting the stimulation of permeability that's taking place, nor are they uh, having a, a major redirection or hosting a large volume of the fluid that's been injected. Um, you can note that even in that model on the far left, that's that cartoon that I made in 2012, I didn't show that as a single hydraulic fracture. I showed that actually as a band of closely spaced hydraulic fractures. Um, that's been a, a surprising result from core through studies in shale in recent years, but actually that's a result that's been seen in core through studies for many, many years, going back to the 90s and 80s. So um, it's actually not a new topic, although we're kind of remembering it uh, more recently, that there can be multiple hydraulic fracture strands in a band. Uh, the second one would be pure shear stimulation. That's where, hey, hydraulic fractures aren't important at all. The only thing that really matters is injection into pre-existing fractures uh, and they slip and experience enhanced uh, conductivity. That actually is uh, a reasonable representation of some hydraulic stimulation treatments in granitic rock for geothermal, uh, but it's really applicable to situations where you have huge faults. So faults that are, you know, kilometers in scale, uh, a, a 30 foot thick fault damage zone with substantial subfracturing and alteration. That's where you could inject into a fault and actually create shear stimulation. And you never need to create a hydraulic fracture. Um, but that's not, I don't think people really think that's what's happening in, in, in oil and gas. Um, moving to the far right, this, what I call the mixed mechanism stimulation is essentially the same as this complex fracture network modeling. The idea that hydraulic fractures will propagate, terminate, and branch. And then this, uh, this one, this third one, pure, uh, primary fracturing with shear stimulation leak off is what I called it in this, in this thesis. The idea that you're predominantly propagating hydraulic fractures, but then you're leaking off into natural fractures, which are slipping and creating kind of a halo, an SRV around the, the hydraulic fractures. So um, that's kind of the end members that I think, you know, these are all hypotheses and these are all things that we really genuinely have to think about and test. And again, the answer uh, may be different on a play-by-play -play basis. And, uh, you know, within the, you know, compare the Marcellus to the Eagleford to the, uh, to the Wolfgang. All right, so a little bit of commentary from the modeling perspective. Uh, the complex fracture network approach greatly increases the computational cost. And so that forces trade-offs. Uh, for example, you might notice here this model on the left is a two-dimensional model. Uh, that's a big trade-off to make, to make the fractures uh, not be 3D. Um, and there's a lot of trade-offs that can occur. But in this presentation, I'm, I'm actually gonna argue that not only uh, is the, co the complex fracture network approach more expensive and it forces trade-offs that may not be worth it. I actually don't think the evidence suggests in that in most, I, I think that in most shales, the evidence suggests that the planar fracture modeling approach is actually closer to reality. So not only is it more computationally efficient, which allows you to bring in all the physics, I actually think it's more realistic. Uh, and, and not, of course, you cannot generalize, but in, in the majority of cases that I've seen. Uh, neither approach can represent all the fractures in the formation, of course. Uh, you know, there are zillions of fractures, many of them too small to represent, even in a DFM. So both approaches, 
are compatible with continuum approaches. For example, you could have these discrete fractures uh, embedded in a dual porosity medium, or you could simply have an effective medium single porosity, such as you could enhance the system permeability in a single porosity model. So uh, certainly to say that neither of this model nor this model is actually showing all the natural fractures, and we can account for them without having to use just a yet more and more and more complicated DFA. Uh, and the last one here is that neither approach is capable of modeling all of the small scale complexity of fracturing. I'll show some images of, of hydraulic fractures from core throughs in a minute, and certainly none of those fractures look exactly like this. So we also have to keep that in mind. Uh, my philosophy there is that we should use constitutive equations to capture field scale complexity. So for example, or the, the field scale effect of small scale complexity. So for example, really don't have time to discuss it, but we'll discuss things like how profit might be trapped by small scale roughness as it flows through hydraulic fractures. Uh, toughness may have a scaling law associated with it due to, to submodel scale um, fracturing. So there's a lot of uh, things here. There's some neat work uh, from Lawrence Livermore on some scaling relations that can be used. So just keep that in mind that both approaches are subject to simplification and we have to use constitutive equations to represent average behavior. All right, so now I'm gonna take a step back and talk about kind of some, his, I think to me, historical arguments that have been made in, fav in favor of a complex model. So top right, this figure is one of the most shown figures, I think probably in the history of oil and gas. Uh, what it's showing is a vertical well in the Barnett Shale and microseismic, uh, and it's, it's representing hydraulic fracturing as a broad fairway of, of fracturing. So that's a, a quite broad region, um, and it's also, they've, they've drawn in these orthogonal fractures. Now, please note that the microseismic doesn't actually show that there is a set of orthogonal fractures. Those are really, you know, the, the author's interpretation of the microseismic. Um, but that, that image is very influential. The broad range of fairways of microseismic from Barnett Shale suggested to people that we were getting uh, broad regions of stimulation. Also, there are certainly studies like this uh, Wolpinski Teufel mine back study from the 80s, uh, where they observed this uh, cartoon that they're showing here hydraulic fractures terminating in disjoints joints and then branching. Um, I just want to note that that mine through study is in a, a, a quite shallow formation. It's also in a very soft volcanic tuff. So while certainly that looks like what happened in that situation, uh, it's a very different geologic setting than typical oil and gas hydraulic fracturing in shale. And so we cannot simply assume that, well, since it was observed in that uh, ash ball, a shallow ash ball tuff, then it's going to happen here uh, in, in, you know, in the Eagleford Shale or the, the Midland Basin. All right, so fracture crossings are a really important part of this. Uh, Renshaw and, and Pollard developed a theory explaining how and why a hydraulic fracture might terminate as it hits a frictional interface. That can occur because it's blunted uh, as if the interface slips. Now, I, you should note that if the interface has cohesion, uh, that, can, um, that can allow the fracture to propagate through. And actually, uh, Professor Bunger has a really neat paper where he shows that it even requires just a little bit of cohesion along a, a fracture to permit a hydraulic fracture to propagate through. Also depends on some other things like stress anisotropy uh, and Gu and Wing had a really neat paper in 2010 where they extended that work to handle uh, angled intersections. And so that, this sort of concept is really foundational to the complex fracture network modeling approach. So this is what it looks like in reality. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of work like this in my PhD. Uh, here I'm showing an example from Khan Wu and John Olson at UT. Uh, and what we can see is that even though up and down is the direction of SH max, um, with this termination, uh, what we can see is that there may be a tendency for the natural fractures to kind of capture the hydraulic fractures. And so the SRV, uh, the fracturing kind of veers off at an angle. Um, and that's something that we can see in these models. There's also this concept of the stimulated rock volume. So here's a cartoon from the recent paper uh, by Sin with Anna Darko. And what they're showing is that there could be leak off and then this kind of halo of enhanced permeability. So I wanna emphasize that I think that this is a hypothesis. I do not think that you can just assume that this is happening in shale. And, and in my experience, it's, it's, uh, it's surprisingly sparse how much actual field scale support exists for this concept. Uh, the core through studies are actually not showing enhancement of permeability uh, around the hydraulic fractures that have formed. Um, and, and I will just say in my personal experience, I have not needed to do this to, to match production data over and over and over again. But, so I, I think this is a hypothesis. All right, so some arguments that have been made in favor of complex hydraulic fracture models um, I'm providing this as background. People have said, well, we need complexity to generate sufficient fracture surface area to get effective stimulation. Complexity is the reason that slick water has proven to be successful and fracture shear stimulate in response to fuel fluid pressure increase, which has to create an SRV. So I actually see floss to all these arguments, but these are some of the arguments that have been provided in favor of the complex fracture modeling approach. Um, 
All right. So here's an example of the first curveball. Neither of these approaches I've mentioned discuss hydraulic fractures that occur in a multi-stranded band. So here's a quarter through from 93, where they're showing a lot of subparallel hydraulic fractures in a, you know, a, a several feet wide zone. Um, and that's also what was observed uh, in some of the more recent core through studies. So Conoco Phillips study done in the Eagle Ford, as well as the hydraulic fracture test site um, in the in the permanent basin. Again, we see a large number of subparallel hydraulic fractures. This is a big challenge that we as modelers need to address somehow. Um, but I also want to emphasize another point. This did not look like a zigzagging pathway where the fractures are going all different directions. They're all very consistently oriented. So I, I really don't think that we're seeing something that looks like, like this. What we're seeing is a, a lot of fractures, but they're all going pretty much the same direction with not a lot of spread. Uh, so what explains those multiple hydraulic fracture strands? I think that's a research question. A lot of people are going to probably work on it for many years. Uh, but some different theories. One of them is that it could be a process, though, that actually forms ahead of the crack tip. So I'm showing that in the bottom right with some rockout crop. Uh, it could be the twisting uh, of the fractures uh, at the top and bottom from mode three uh, twisting. There's a nice presentation from Robert Hurd uh, on that. Uh, there could be others. Um, but we don't know exactly. But certainly, it seems to be happening. Uh, here, this is the, uh, the diagram showing the orientation of the fractures encountered uh, in the Radom and Corthur study. And I, what I want to bring out is that while there's a lot of them, they're all very consistently oriented. Uh, they're not in a zigzagging maze-like pathway. Uh, this is from the Wolfcamp Corthur study. I think there's a little more spread in the fracture orientations, but it's still pretty consistent. They're all fractures going in the same direction. Uh, I'd say that's also supported by the microseismic. Uh, of course, there's a lot of you know, uh, a lot of interpretation that goes into microseismic and processing, but here they're seeing mostly linear features. Um, and then the fiber optic response is something that I really want to bring out. So recently, companies have started putting fiber optic and offset wells. Uh, here's an example, a published example from Sh Shell. And what they're showing here is that when you fracture a stage in one well, you can draw a straight line in the direction of SH max, and that's exactly where you're going to hit the offset well. Now, if there's a fault, it's possible that a fault could capture it and you could see an exception or you could have a zonal isolation problem. You know, this is not a perfect rule, but largely speaking, what it looks like is that hydraulic fractures propagate pretty darn linearly, uh, pretty consistently orientation, and in a pretty narrow band. Uh, maybe the difference between microseismic and fiber optic is there's a huge amount of location uncertainty in microseismic, but a fiber optic is a direct observation of strain right at the well, much harder to argue with and a lot higher precision. And I think this paper from, from Shell is really the tip of the iceberg. A lot of companies are doing this and not publishing it. Um, and I think that this finding, uh, this is something that every company should do in their play and, uh, and see just, just how broad is your region of, of stimulation, because uh, you can really observe it directly here. Now, there's definitely small scale complexity. I don't want to underplay that. Here's some examples from the core through studies. I mean, this, this actually almost does look like shattered rock, right? So there is certainly some complexity taking place. But the question is, should a reservoir scale fracturing model attempt to represent you know, this inch scale behavior? And my argument would be we can use constitutive equations to change things like toughness and profit transport to, to uh, capture the effect of this without literally trying to capture it. If you're in a research application, you know, maybe you do want to do a really detailed model like this, and that would be really interesting. But I, my perspective personally is from the field scale practical track design perspective. Um, now, this problem of multiple strands is a really big one, and so I really want to get to the punchline here. Um, and this was, I thought, the most important and interesting study of this whole series. What they did in the, in the 2019 paper with Conoco Phillips is they put pressure gauges outside the offset well. They left it shut in, and then they produced. And so what we're seeing here is that um, while the gray lines are representing all of the hydraulic fracture strands they intersected, the black lines are representing the hydraulic fracture strands that had evidence of propant in them. A, a much smaller number. So there's far fewer prop fractures than hydraulic fractures. Uh, and then the orange dots here represent pressure gauges. So this, I think, is the figure. This is such an interesting figure. What they're showing here on the x-axis is the distance of a pressure gauge to the closest uh, propped fracture. So for example, if we took this orange dot here, it's from here to here is the closest propped hydraulic fracture. So we'd take that distance and we'd plot it on the x-axis here. So every dot here is a pressure gauge. Uh, and on the y-axis is pressure. So we're actually seeing how depleted are these pressure gauges after uh, you know, a year or two of production. 
Um, and here's what we see, that the only variable they found that was correlated with depletion was distance to a propped hydraulic fracture. And not only that, it's perhaps coincidental, probably not, that if you draw a line through this trend, it looks like a square root trend. It is one dimensional flow through rock of permeability on the order of 50 to 150 nanodarcy. So it looks a lot like one dimensional flow into propped fractures uh, through an actually unstimulated in situ formation permeability of 50 to 150 nanodarcy. So that's, that's essentially the planar fracture modeling um, perspective. A bunch of fractures that are nearly parallel, fairly widely spaced, and then there's one dimensional flow through a matrix or it could be a system with small scale fracturing, but we can virtually treat it as a single continuum um, into those fractures. And so this is a very important figure in my mind. Now these unpropped fractures that they're seeing, they contribute to leak out. And, and that's actually quite notable uh, when we do frac modeling in ResFrac, in order to match flowback, we have to assume there's a tremendously accelerated leak off during fracturing. And I think what we're really doing there is we're, we're saying, okay, well, during fracturing, there's a lot of uncropped fractures those dramatically accelerate leak off and accelerate fracture closure. But then when those fractures close, a smaller subset of them have the planar fractures. And so in the planar fracture model, we're trying to represent this smaller subset of propped fractures, and we're, we're using accelerated leak off to capture the effect of all of these much more numerous but unpropped fractures that contribute to leak off, but not necessarily much to production. All right, um, I'll skip a few slides here. I'll mention micro seismicity. Uh, micro seismicity is very useful. It's a foundational part of how we build track models. Uh, we think it's critical for understanding frac geometry. However, it does not necessarily correlate to production. I think that this is a hypothesis to be tested. Um, just for example, here in the ConocoPhillips core through study, micro seismic density was uncorrelated with the depletion observed at the offset well. This is what they're showing here. Here's another published example where um, size of the SRV was found to be uncorrelated with production. And here's a third example. If we look at this image, if you said, well, which of these two wells produce better? Is it the one with a very huge, large, and dense microseismic cloud around it, or is it the one with the small, short microseismic cloud? It's actually the one on the right with the small, short microseismic cloud. Now, these authors are so hypothesize there could be some near well pinch off related to the well bore orientation, but I think it's pretty striking that, that there's here, there's just such a mismatch. Um, and so, you know, I, I think everyone should be familiar with examples like this. We just have to understand that these are hypotheses to be tested. So some implications from Raderman, they're finding that there's a relatively smaller number of dominant hydraulic fractures that have most of the propent and they dominate depletion. They're mostly all in the same orientation. Um, let's see. Um, they, they actually, neither Raderman nor Gale reported evidence of permeability enhancement around those dominant hydraulic fractures. And the pressure depletion plot here doesn't require that to be the case. Um, you know, permeabilities of 50 to 150 nanodarcies, that's completely plausible to me. Uh, that's the kind of permeability we'd estimate from a DFIT, for example, in shale. Um, all right. They did suggest that perhaps they got contribution from those unpropped fractures, but only very near the well. So maybe it's an early time effect. I think that's an interesting idea. All right. So now I'm going to come back to the complex fracture modeling approach and bring some, some, some problems up. So number one, on the bottom right here, this is a figure from Bohorich and Olson. At UT, what they're showing is that if a hydraulic fracture, even if it did terminate against a natural fracture, uh, and that natural fracture wasn't co didn't have cohesion anywhere, well, you could just propagate over and under it. Uh, and so the fractures would have to be very large to actually accomplish a genuine termination of a field scale hydraulic fracture. But over here on the left, I have a core through some uh, Barnett shale. Um, and a th couple things I want to bring up. Number one, uh, we can actually see that this fracture here is terminating in the core. Well, consider that the core is very small. Um, if the fractures were very, very large, you know, in a, in a field scale DFN, we're having to represent them as you know, tens of feet or hundreds of feet fractures in a DFN in a complex fracture network model, um, then it's very unlikely that such a large fracture would be terminating inside of the core. Um, and so it's, I think it is a hypothesis, and it's not, obvious, it's not obvious to me, and it perhaps may not be the case that the fractures are big enough to actually be the size that the, we actually assume they are in a DFN type approach. Um, I'd also note that these fractures are in fact cemented full of calcite. And so that gives them cohesion that might make them less likely to slip, less likely to terminate a hydraulic fracture and also may prevent them from hosting substantial conductivity and permeability enhancement. So, you know, these are all kind of issues here. We just have to be aware of this. All right, so some other problems uh, with the complexity argument. Number one, you need complexity to explain production rate. Well, I would say that we have done projects with 
planar fracture models uh, that do not use a DFN um, across nearly every major shell play in the U.S. And um, we consistently match history match to the production. Uh, I just haven't observed that, that I need to create a DFN to match production data. Um, and we use our, we use perms in the range of 10 to 500 nanodarcies mostly. You know, it could get up to a few microdarcies in some formations like the uh, the Bakken, for example. Um, but generally speaking, it's not necessary. And when we do DFIT permeability estimates, I would say the majority of the time we can take those and almost directly just hand them into uh, an RTA history match uh, or a history match regress rack, and we're already pretty close to the answer right off the bat. Point two, fracture shear stimulate in response to fluid pressure increase. Well, they might. Depends on things like clay content. But consider that there's a lot of things that have to fall into place to get a ubiquitous shear stimulation in an SRV. So the fractures have to be properly oriented. They have to uh, slip in the stress state. They have to be conductive enough to take fluid. So you can't shear stimulate a fracture unless it pressurizes, and it won't pressurize unless it's conductive. If it's sealed shut, it may not accept fluid rapidly enough to shear stimulate at a time scale that's relevant to your fracture. Um, they also have to be in a percolating, so they have to maintain conductivity, unpropped conductivity long term, which may or may not happen. Certainly, clay is going to tend to destroy unpropped conductivity. Um, and finally, you have to have a percolating network. So, what I'm showing here is if you have a very large number of, of small fractures and you try to inject into that, you might sure stimulate a few, but you don't have continuous pathways for flow, and so you're not going to get kind of a large range propagation of shear stimulation. So I just want to point out that there's a lot of conditions, like maybe about a half dozen conditions, where everything has to be aligned to get shear stimulation that spreads ubiquitously through a formation. Um, and I think it's, it's something that is almost far-fetched to assume that all of our shale plays have that special series of conditions. Um, a simpler, a simpler interpretation is we're just making a bunch of planar hydraulic fractures and pulling rock into them. Um, so the third one is slick water has been successful because it creates complexity. Well, slick water also avoids gel damage to the prop and pack. And I do think that even in shale, uh, the conductivity of the prop and pack is relevant. Uh, it's also cheaper. It also has a higher, um, uh, it's worth pointing out that slick water actually does have some fluid additive in it, even though it has lower wellbore friction. It actually has a higher viscosity than water. Uh, and you can do some back of the envelope calculations and show that you can, even with slick water, you can get prop at hundreds of feet out into the formation away from the well, just depending on it, the, the prop it being carried by fluid and having it gravitationally settle through the fracture. There's some SPE papers out there that use, for example, Stokes Law to predict um, uh, prop it settling rate in slick water. I'll even admit I have one. Um, but then you realize actually Stokes Law is only intended for very thick fluids. Um, and it about 10x overestimates the settling rate uh, in slick water. So um, actually, it's, it's not that bad. Um, also, slick water enables higher injection rate, which improves loaded entry. So those are some of the issues here that I see with these arguments. Um, and so here, I, I'll skip this slide, but you can just do a quick back of the envelope calculation and convince yourself that um, a typical shale well in, in, in a typical, you know, you, know, you, you, you can have pretty small fractures in a planar fracture model and pretty low permeability and still get great production. And, and you can actually just back that out from a back of the envelope calculation. Um, all right, so I want to save time here. Uh, I'll skip ahead to this slide. Just want to point out this example. So this is a paper we did last fall where we looked at optimization of well and cluster spacing in the Utica. Um, and what we looked at was that the, the DFIT interpretation, there were kind of two ways to interpret the DFIT. One of them yielded a really high gas shale permeability. The other yielded a much lower, in this case, I'm showing 25 nanodarcies. So there's 25 versus 850 nanodarcies in shale. So the history match to like the rate transient, you can actually match either one. Uh, because it's a non-unique trade-off between fracture surface area and the square root of permeability. So we were able to history match models with both of those perms. And so I think that's critical because it, it shows us that, that depending on your belief about permeability, you can arrive at radically different beliefs about fracture geometry. But conversely, if you thought that the permeability was one nanodarcy, then you may actually start to be forced to use a DFN. That's where you finally start to use enough permeability. But keep in mind when we're talking about permeability, I'm talking about system perm. There could be pre-existing natural fractures out in the formation that I'm considering part of the permeability. Um, so uh, just, just keep that in mind as well. But actually, the way that we recommended doing this was actually much lower than the other way. So there are actually you know, some, some ways to interpret defects that are giving these, these really high permeabilities and gas shale. We're coming in with a lower perm, which should 
increase the amount of surface area required. And even then, we have no problem history matching the, the production data with planar fractures at each cluster. So, I mean, this is just one example, but when you actually start history matching data, what you quickly discover is, oh yeah, planar fractures have no problem matching these, these data sets. All right, so certainly there's complexity at small scale. Um, the course shows a lot of complexity. Uh, and, and so what we do in ResFrac, we use constitutive equations to represent that. So for example, bottom right here, we're seeing profit getting trapped in a rough fracture. Uh, we do think, I strongly think, and this is discussed in, in that other paper I mentioned, uh, our, our nuances and frequently asked questions paper at HFTC, I think propent gets trapped in the fractures as it, as it flows through. But um, the way we can model that is a constitutive equation rather than try to literally you know, model the details of this centimeter scale complexity. And so that's how we handle complexity. Uh, it's analogous, I think, to a relative permeability curve. You can do poor throat modeling to, you know, you know, with Lattice Boltzmann to, to derive well perm curves, or you can just use a well perm curve in a reservoir simulator. It's that sort of thing. Constitutive equations are ubiquitously used in engineering to represent the large scale effects of small scale complexity. Um, all right, let's see. Yeah, and so I just, I'll point out to this example here. Uh, this is a paper we had with Hess at HFTC this year. And actually we have a, a more detailed uh, restaurant specific follow-up at ATCE this year. We have a complex history, uh, and this is a Bakken well, where the, the, the parent well is, is uh, produced for many years, and then we fracture an offset well, we do defense in the offset well, we have frack hits, we have preloading, we have all these different things happening, uh, and we have absolutely no issue matching the data uh, in a planar fracture model. So check out, the HFTC paper is kind of our draft uh, of the rest frack work, we were a section of that paper, but our ATCE paper is a, a detailed description of, of the final result. Um, and so really, I guess my point here is just that we have over and over and over managed to match data very successfully uh, and very consistently and getting good results using a planar fraction model approach. So my personal perspective on this, I've converged to the belief and I've changed my mind in the last 10 years that in most jail plays, most of the time, fractures propagate mostly linearly and they do not have a zigzagging pathway. Uh, planar fracture models are certainly simplifications, but they broadly match reality when you zoom out to a reservoir scale and you use constitutive relations to handle the small scale, the kind of sub-model scale effects of different processes. Um, complex hydraulic fracture models have a higher computational burden, and so they have to compromise on other aspects of the physics. But not only that, I actually don't think that they're necessarily uh, the right way to go. They're not necessarily the most realistic. Uh, I'll certainly, again, give the disclaimer that uh, these are hypotheses to be tested. It depends on application and formation. Maybe it even depends on for fracturing style, although I'm not sure that's the case. Um, and so ultimately, I think we can do things like optimize cluster spacing, well spacing, limit entry completion, and profit loading uh, with planar fraction models. So I have reached the end. I think I did pretty, pretty decent on time. I did my best <laughs> um, and would be happy to take some questions.